weeks in a row. I just want to bring a couple of interesting things for you to know. Our AIA offices are open. However, I encourage that you give uh, Cheryl Jacobs or Colleen a phone call as they may have some restricted hours due to social distancing. Second thing is we are going to have our design awards celebration this year. It's going to be October 3rd and the design awards will, the call is going to be going out shortly. The registration will be July 17th and all uploads for projects will be August 14th. Other things that we're doing to provide value to our members is besides the town hall meetings, every Monday we send out a newsletter specifically related to COVID-19. Every Wednesday, MCAD, our sister organization, provides a newsletter as well. And every Friday, our members receive Friday Facts, which is a combination of interesting information that pertains to our chapter, things that are happening in Tallahassee, advocacy for our profession, and even has opportunities uh, for our fees and projects that you can bid on. So lots of ways to get involved as well. We're looking for volunteers to help us prepare this fantastic party that we're gonna have on October 3rd. So if you're interested in networking, whether if you're an employee looking to meet other coworkers in different places, or if you're interested in getting a job, this volunteering is a great way to meet potential employers. Please feel free to reach out to either Cheryl, Colleen, or myself, and we can guide you on how you can help out. And uh, with that, I'll share, I'll turn it back to Cheryl. Hi, everybody. Cheryl Jacobs, uh, Executive Vice President, AIA Miami. Welcome. Thank you, Daphne. Uh, so let me bring to you our fantastic uh, panelists today. Uh, we're uh, happy to have with us. Anthony Abate, uh, Associate Provost for the Broward campuses at Florida Atlantic University. Welcome, Tony. And don't forget to unmute yourself. Uh, Jason Chandler, uh, Chair and Associate Professor of the Department of Acro sorry to say Agriculture, Architecture <laughs> at Florida International University of the Carta. Um, Hello. And Hi, Jason. And last but not least, Dorota Falcori, Vice President. Oh, you know what? I started to read what we had from uh, last time. Dean at the School of Architecture, the University of Miami. <laughs> Sorry about that, Rudy. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. So, um, I, you know, wow, we've been going through a lot of uh, a really unprecedented, crazy time for all of us. And I, I know the uh, universities have been uh, greatly impacted this uh, by this. And I think just have something I'm gonna ask all of you. Um, what are some of the biggest things that the university did uh, to adapt to the pandemic? You wanna start, Rudy? Uh, well, yeah. And in a space basically of two weeks, when the pandemic hit, we had to transition online for all of our, most of our university functions, including teaching. Fortunately, it happened during the spring break, so we had time to adapt. So the university set up a lot of resources, workshops, etc., to bring the faculty up to speed, uh, uh, training, etc., for the use of uh, teleconference and digital platforms, and uh, it's, it worked astonishingly well. Actually, uh, surprising how a uh, few glitches we had. We were expecting more problems, uh, but actually, it worked out pretty well, and the results at the end of the term was were very impressive counterintuitively actually the courses that work best are the ones that you would suspect to be most resistant to remote learning like studio instructions but because studio is so much about one-on-one -on -one tutorials i think this worked very well with zoom or other uh, teleconferencing platforms the bigger challenges came 
from the large lecture courses where you don't have this kind of intense one-on-one -on -one, uh, relationship uh, with the instructor. But overall, I think we did very well and um, we're very happy with the results in terms of the educational programs. Of course, research and all kinds of administrative processes that also had to go online. And there are other challenging challenges there, but we're focusing here on education. Education in the School of, school of Architecture too. Tony, how about you? Um, I don't want to repeat uh, <laughs> what I've just said, but generally the, the biggest uh, thing we did, we received notice from the state university system I think it was just in the middle of spring break, we were given literally three days to prepare. Uh, some faculty are already familiar with uh, online learning. It wasn't too difficult, but the School of Architecture, um, practically none of the faculty have online, fully online courses. And if they have anything, it's, uh, it's uh, known as a syn synchronous course, so there's meetings involved. So we had to transition about 1,250 faculty, including our adjuncts and part-time faculty, which were the biggest challenge uh, to online platforms. Uh, interestingly, the ACSA, the Association of Collegiate Schools of Architecture, hosted a few, a few meetings, uh, which were quite helpful uh, to faculty, uh, particularly uh, meetings involving the San Francisco Academy of Art, which I believe has one of the few, if not the only, uh, fully online Bachelor of Architecture program. They were very generous in sharing their rubrics and their techniques. Uh, we also learned that they, their first year design studio is completely analog. So the students are drafting, sketching, making models, and then they have to photograph them and present them using photography and video, which they learned along the way. I found this quite, quite fascinating. Um, and it was an interesting sort of way for us to crack open the, I would say, pedagogical lockbox in terms of how we deliver information. But all 12 universities in the state university system are engaged in proactive planning. We developed an ad hoc committee, which included faculty from architecture because of their expertise in space planning and logistics. And we're, the purpose of that committee is to plan for the eventual reopening. Uh, the biggest impact is a plan for projected loss in revenue, given that uh, state revenues were hit approximately 40%. Uh, the university initiated immediate hiring freezes, which impacted the School of Architecture in terms of uh, suspending a search for new director and history faculty. Uh, the other big issue for us are the students' uh, financial aid uh, money uh, and the students' vulnerability uh, in terms of their economic situation. Most of the students, about 60% of them, put themselves through school uh, and are employed. Uh, so this was an impact that we're still feeling. Uh, we set up an emergency fund for students. It's designed to provide financial assistance for those who are currently enrolled and experiencing hardships. We developed uh, three options for faculty. Um, there's a flex online teaching orientation, which allows a faculty to move their course from face-to-face -to, -face to online. They're given a $100 stipend for taking that course. It's several weeks long, but not too difficult. I had to do it simultaneously with teaching online, so that was interesting. Uh, there's an academic continuity course build, which is essentially preparing the courses, such as the summer, which is, uh, we're fully online in the summer, and we tend to have a proportion of classes online in the fall. So to prepare those fully online full courses, it's a $250 stipend. And then there's a keep teaching one-stop online resource for faculty, uh, and the support is extraordinary, to put it mildly. There's 24-7 support for faculty in terms of preparing their online and dealing with uh, issues, uh, both in terms of student and faculty. Great, thanks. Um, I think someone may not be muted, so I just want to ask you to please mute um, your microphones. And Jason, how about you? Um, Similar stuff. I I think the I mean in, in retrospect, looking at the spring, one of the successes was that it was really a hybrid semester. So um, the summer is different because it is fully remote for us. Uh, but if I look at sort of the 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 path of that semester, we many of our studios had traveled with faculty out of state. Um, 
So we had, you know, beginnings of very intense face-to-face, place-based, you know, one-on-one events. Um, and I, we even had a Genoa program, which really is a year, th- year program that began in the fall. The students returned back to studio uh, in, in the spring. And basically, we had 10 weeks of face-to-face traditional instruction and then six weeks of um, remote. So in a lot of ways, the remote for us kind of coincided with the sort of end of semester push, which has a tendency to be more focused. You know, students sort of know what they need to do and can kind of focus on that. So it was ideal in an uncanny way in a lot of respects. That coupled with FIU has been bullish on online as an institution. So we have 55,000 students, 20,000 of them are already online. Um, So it's an institution that has has thought about alternate modalities of teaching to expand its reach. Um, And every class has a Canvas platform, which is a a kind of online platform that allows you to grade, allows you to put put, uh, lectures up. So every class when we made that switch and we made it on, on March 12th, sort of from Tuesday to Thursday, we went from face to face to online. We, we call it remote because it's not truly online. Um, remote synchronous teaching, which I also think was very important. Um, in a way, and I was teaching studio that semester, the, the kind of intensity of Zoom, the, the sort of extra work of Zoom was profound. I, every instructor, I think, said all their studios went much further. You always had to sort of teach an extra half hour, an hour, just to cover um, all the people. Um, but so, so all these things were good. They were welcome. The other sort of benefit was you know, in the, this kind of taking models, sort of the loss of the collective model was replaced with movies. And our students and our support classes had a bunch of workshops where, you know, even our sort of, not quite lower division, but sort of our, our juniors were doing pretty advanced movies in a very fast period of time, which was perfect for this, this platform. So those were the benefits. The, the negatives were, was, I guess, from a teaching standpoint, this sort of, I mean, I, the joke is, this is all making me feel very isolated. Uh, but the idea that you could walk into a studio and get a vibe very quickly and sort of see a studio broadly and understand the, the kind of feel for the studio in, in terms of production, in terms of mood, in terms of sort of moment of where the studios and studios are always, my colleagues I'm sure can jump in, um, sort of, a, a management of time and effort over a protected period is always a skill of a, a great studio instructor. So, so that was very hard to deal with. And then my last point is um, uh, students really did not like, particularly my graduating students, not having a graduation. Like we're yeah. profoundly upset by that. Um, and on our side, we do our, we have a end of semester, we have a super jury for our graduates. And for me, that's always my favorite time of the year. We did it online, it was successful, it happened, but it was very hard to, again, that, that moment of, of coming together at the end of, you know, five year event for these, for, for many of these students, uh, not being able to do that collectively was a hard thing. Um, and I fear, I mean, we did the online graduations, everyone did that, but I think that sort of the, 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 the collective bonding that you have with your classmates, um, again, I, I think more people were, were uh, surprised by that because they thought, oh, this wasn't so bad until that had happened. And people began to really rethink, oh, what, what, what was lost? And certainly that was six weeks into it. So there's a little exhaustion as it relates to you know, how much of this uh, Zoom can you take? Um, <laughs> which, which I always equate to when you're young, you think you go to the movies and you say, oh, I'm going to sneak and see all the movies I can today. <laughs> Even the most hardy of us can't handle more than like three movies. After a while, you just too much. <laughs> you know, like it's a modality that has its limits. So, you know, and, and I'm sure everyone's been on these sort of internal Zoom days where you just wake up and Zoom all day long until you can't take it and mm-hmm. it's the end of the day. So I think that that's a challenge and I am very attentive right now to our summer, which is now truly a fully remote experience um, because the university is closed and we don't have even a minor check-in with our students. So I I actually am quite concerned and I have a lot of anecdotal evidence that 
students and faculty are craving some kind of connection, even if it's episodic, uh, particularly in studio, uh, to, to sort of get those connections that we, again, we've probably taken for granted and didn't even know were really sort of valuable until you lose them. So, uh, yeah. yeah, that's, that's my... So let me ask you, have, uh, have the universities um, made a decision about opening back up in the fall? Rudy? Oh, you're on mute. Yes, there you go. Indeed, the university and the president has been, President Frank is very vocal, visible about the commitment of the uh, University of Miami to be open on site mm -hmm. this uh, fall. Uh, we think we, it's important. We think it's part of the value proposition of the university and we think we can do it safely. And it's very complicated to achieve this and that we are working very hard on it. But yes, no doubt the commitment is for on-site uh, education uh, starting uh, this fall. The schedule also has shifted to one week earlier, so the classes begin on uh, August 17th and uh, end uh, the week that we break for the Thanksgiving holiday so the students don't have to come back. The, the, In between the... the, the yes, the right. travel back and forth and potentially miss uh, uh, a predicted second wave that is supposed to arrive uh, late in the fall. Yeah. Maybe. So, Maybe, we'll see. But at least also we miss the, the, reg the regular flu season also partially. So there are, there are many advantages to the, the shift in the, the schedule. Uh, but that means that the final exams will be online and the final review also will be online. Will be online. I have to say that one of the we the things that worked best in terms of the remote learning, the many problems, and of course we are anxious to be on site, but one of the things that actually worked pretty well, and we would like to consider, actually we are considering con sustaining this aspect of it beyond the pandemic is uh, the online or t t uh, remote uh, uh, final review because we were able to enlist a very vast uh, uh, group of people from all over the world to uh, join us for the final reviews. It was very exciting. Uh, the students really appreciated the diversity actually in the jury participation and we, we would like to find a way to sustain this beyond the pandemic. Uh, yeah, uh, th that's something that we're seeing too in, in terms of our just our programming that you can bring in people from all over. Uh, Jason, uh, I, I know that uh, j um, the universities, you know, part of the state university system, so I don't know if there's a global decision or if each uh, institution can make its own rules, but what are you uh, planning for the fall? You're on mute still, Jason. Tony and I are in the same boat. We are both uh, state university system right. institutions. Um, and my, again, I can speak to uh, FIU, the, uh, the Board of Trustees basically just approved uh, our president's um, proposal. They're, they're basically calling it, uh, at least from the state university system, repopulating plans. Um, so FIU plans a combination of in-person, online, remote, and hybrid classes um, and is planning to open in, again, this kind of hybrid mode for the fall. But the presidents of each university uh, on June 23rd are presenting to the Board of Governors their plan. So my understanding is that the governor, at, at my guess, is interested in having the universities open in the fall, but there's also such variety in the, the, the types of schools, in terms of scale, in terms of residency, that each university will probably have, within that context, a customized plan. And I defer to Tony on to FAU side of this. Yeah, basically, we're in a similar situation. Um, you know, the question was, when will the campuses open? Uh, we plan to open August 22nd, which is the beginning of our fall term. And how we deal with it, uh, 
it frankly depends on the health of students, staff, faculty, the size, density of the class, the space allocation and schedule, the availability of sanitizing equipment and supplies. Uh, so we began with an alternative work arrangement request form uh, sent out to faculty who are either eight, over age 65 or have any or present any of the CDC guideline health risks. Uh, and then that way the faculty can request to be uh, taught or teach remotely and perform all of their work remotely. Uh, the university will allocate special support for these faculty. Um, the plan is to open. Uh, what that translates to is a university-wide limit uh, in uh, class by class uh, in terms of people in the classroom of 20% of the original occupancy. So this is to uh, uh, implement social distancing in the classroom. And any students, we're either going to have additional sections of smaller groups in larger rooms uh, in combination with uh, uh, synchronous delivery um, uh, of the course. So, so the oh, students have the option that they'll be, able, they'll be able to opt to go to class or attend online. So the idea here is that but, but no class will have more than 20% of its occupancy. And in addition, the focus is going to be on the first year freshmen, uh, second year students, and in our case, uh, the third year students, because our Bachelor of Architecture degree group begins in the third year. Those groups will have a priority of face-to-face. -face. Uh, most of the classes will try to deliver that way. Um, but anything in upper division or graduate level, uh, we're encouraged to offer online if possible to make room to permit uh, these face-to-face -face arrangements with the 20% rule. Um, you had a question, sorry, you really didn't ask. But then in addition to that, you know, with regard to students, getting back to the issue of their ability to access tools, um, uh, if they have a problem, if their laptops at home or their um, connectivity is, is not that great or they don't have access to software, uh, we've developed a system for them to remotely access the computers in the computer lab so they can remotely actually take over a computer in the computer lab and work on Mino and develop their projects using the software in that lab. Um, that is sort of a one-on-one. -on -one, uh, the student would have to file a ticket, a help desk ticket to make that happen. Uh, we found that to be very helpful for a couple of students in the spring and as well currently in the summer. We'll probably be continuing that in the fall. So thanks. So you know, and there's so much, and we talked about this a little bit, but there's so much in um, educating architects that has to do with collaboration and you know ideas feeding off each other and uh, discussions about design. And so, how how do you think that this either hybrid or having classes online how do you think that that in the long run is going to affect uh, how the how young architects are educated and how how they uh, take that knowledge that they've learned into the real world? Rudy. Yes, I mean that's very well put. I mean, there's I don't think there's a substitute to being with a group of people in the same room collaborating on a project. And this is why we are anxious to be back on campus. But that said, I have to say that the profession has already been finding, uh, has been looking for ways to collaborate uh, online and to uh, restructure the workflow and the, and the practice so as to accommodate remote collaboration. So, the, pla the, pla the BIM platforms that we use actually are equipped for this, so many people can work on the same document and it's up updated uh, in real time. Uh, uh, many tools, digital tools that uh, we use are already very much designed for remote collaboration. But even sometimes when we are working together on site, we have to use these digital tools like Google Docs, etc., that facilitate collaboration. So I would say that, yes, there's really, we need to be, there's this something about being in the same room, live in real time with people working, exchanging ideas. 
but I have to say that actually the many digital tools that we have actually bring something else also supplement this process and enable collaborations in many ways. So I think there is a good there there is also a benefit to uh, to thinking of collaboration uh, uh, in in new ways uh, deploying digital media and what we've learned from this uh, exercise and crisis management uh, <laughs> uh, uh, this uh, in the past few months actually is going to help us actually think of collaborations in new ways beyond also the crisis. So I'm that, looking forward to actually deploying some of these new instruments that are, have now been sharpened during this uh, the crisis. Well, I know that the architects have been finding all kinds of um, different uh, software platforms, not just Zoom or, or Teams um, in the, you know, to do their work with. And I'm sure that that will translate into the schools as well. Tony, yeah, so I saw you nodding. Oh, go no, ahead. One thing I want to add is that actually I myself, usually I teach just one course a year because I have so much to do in terms of the administration of the school, but I'm actually taking on more teaching because I'm exploring the potential of uh, augmented reality and uh, Mag Magic Leaps platform due to this partnership we have with, with uh, Magic Leap. We have access to all these new resources that they are making available to us, including a, re a kind of remote collaboration tool using augmented reality that we would like to test in the studio environment. So that should be very interesting also. That's very cool. Tony. Yeah, I mean, I would have to agree in general. Um, the overall notion of what we call studio culture, um, I think, is challenged by this. And, uh, you know, we have discussion groups and online forum meetings. Uh, of course, they're, they're not ideal because there's time delays with these virtual tools, depending on your, your uh, I don't know what you call it, internet speed. Uh, and whether you remember to turn on your microphone or not. So there's a, sort of this time lag, which takes away some of the spontaneity of exchange of ideas. Um, however, faculty have reported, and I've experienced myself, that this no, the social hierarchy of who's up front versus in the back of the room is completely disrupted because everyone is focused on who's on screen. And every student uh, has an equal voice, which I find refreshing and encouraging. Um, in addition, this lack of being able to be in a space where you have access to these expensive tools and, 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 and uh, quality materials, the students are, are being very resourceful. And we've been encouraging them to use cereal boxes and Amazon packing boxes as long as, <laughs> as, long as the craft is there, right? It reminds me of these sort of uh, developing countries where we see uh, trash being turned into objects, you know, toys, you name it. But as long as the craft is there, the content is there. Um, I haven't, I don't, I was going to share an image, but it's, I don't want to take up time. But I had a student present uh, their study model for a building using staples. Mm -hmm. You know, the idea that you, staples come in this little array that you plug into the stapler. Well, using that as a module, they, they built a whole model, site plan, study models, using staples and very carefully photographed it. Quite interesting, wow. the creativity that, and resourcefulness that they're demonstrating, and I think there's a value to that. Uh, you know, the jury's out, literally, in terms of how we measure these things, but I do think there's some value, um, quite frankly. The other thing that students are doing is they're forming their own groups, and I think um, uh, uh, Jason mentioned Canvas, which we use as well at FAU, and in the Canvas format, you can have uh, collaborations and students can create their own meetings. So I created a studio, virtual studio space that's their space. I may visit now and then, but it's really their space where they can share videos, Revit drawings, whatever they want among each other and, and, and have active back and forth conversation. They're using it and they're creating their own little uh, spaces where they're teaching each other design tools. Someone may have an expertise in InDesign or Rhino that they showed in a presentation. Students are interested in learning about what they did. So that student will set up a little mini training session within the course uh, using one of these tools. I find all of that quite stimulating and exciting. 
uh, uh, I think it does prepare them for a profession that's more collaborative and open in terms of exchange of information. That's interesting. Um, I think that that uh, creativity is what architecture is all about, and also problem solving. So um, that's part of what happens. Jason, what do you think? Um, I'll just hop sort of really two points is the idea that uh, we we, pres we we have a a spectrum of modalities of of collaboration. I think that's that's always been the case. I think of these things, I am always nervous about the sort of revolutionary spirits uh, for any number of reasons, but things typically are, are, are much more gradual. There are obviously moments of acceleration, but the sort of evolution of architectural education has been going on for a while. Um, and we were just right before COVID, like literally two weeks before we, we had done the sort of analysis that uh, Tony had mentioned that the freshmen have a tendency to be, you know, pack animals. They want to work together. They're messy. They're in studio. And as they sort of grow up, they become much more savvy collaborators, open to kind of different contexts in which to do their work. Um, and obviously, that's good because they mature and then they go out and into the real world. So there is that kind of spectrum. And I think to to present an education that is a one size fits all for these different populations is foolhardy. I mean, obviously, but I think those thoughts that you have this kind of complex, I hate to say it, sort of educational delivery system makes sense. And I think, you know, it's the same as, do you send your freshman off to study abroad for a semester out of the gate? Maybe not, right? That you want that to be a little later. But you would say that the idea, at least for us, study abroad has gone from, you know, the full sort of traditional semester abroad to two, three week trips, to even weekend trips. Like, so, those kind of monolithic things have, I think, slowly become eroded and become more um, complex. The last point is I, I've always been curious, there is the nature of, of architects to sort of embrace technologies. I mean, that's, I think, Mises' comment that technology is the only sort of constant revolution that we have at hand. Um, and I, and I think it's interesting because it, the idea of, of making these decisions now because of a sort of uh, a calamity is always, you might have to be very suspicious of these things because I think the education reflects the impulse of the architects and there are tech, technophiles out there and there are sort of trends of, of you know, high uh, sort of place, uh, placeness work um, uh, and high reliance on the latest technologies for, for whatever, you know, super complex buildings, but simultaneously there are, there are firms that are practicing uh, in, in reverse ways where they're looking, you know, principally at building as something that is, you know, bricks and mortar and there's issues of craft and there's, there's less reliance on sort of technologies of, of sophistication. So I think those tendencies are always present in, in architecture and they kind of pit each other and you can pick the era where one is winning over the other, but we've sort of entered this kind of, I guess now very long, call it whatever you want, moment of plurality as it relates to what constitutes a reasonable architectural proposal. Um, and I think that will ultimately, I think of our education as I've got, you know, faculty with radically different ideas about what is uh, uh, important to give to our students. But I think that collage of uh, uh, ideas makes it great. So I, 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 I think this is just another version of a evolution of education that has been changing for the last 200 years. Just another challenge. That seems to me. You know, um, so uh, in the fall when um, students start coming back, how are you, what, what are the, what, like if you're limited to a building with X number of you know rooms, how do you handle you know smaller classes and physical distancing? I hate the term social distancing. So how do you how do you handle that? And do you have fewer students, Tony? Well, uh, per section, yes. Uh, fewer students per section. And the design studios are fairly spacious, I guess, to begin with. 
but the rules will be different um, in terms of maintaining distance, but also what you touch, the availability of sanitary uh, sanitation uh, you know, products. I mean, if you think about it, everything you touch, doorknobs, elevator buttons, a desk, a chair, the back of a chair, a pencil, a cardboard, uh, and COVID lives for quite some time on all of these materials, particularly stainless steel, even cardboard. I mean, it's, it's several, a couple of days. So it's, it's, a, it's a challenge. And um, I think part of it begins with monitoring the health of the student and the faculty member. So, uh, you know, if, if you are healthy and you have not been exposed and you uh, answer the questions that you, you, have, you don't have symptoms, you'll be allowed in the building, number one. And once you're in the building, uh, there are these alternative work arrangements that are being developed. Now, again, as I said, it's not a fixed situation. And this is probably the biggest challenge is the lack of certainty about any of it. Um, however, uh, I believe that the students are anxious, the faculty are anxious, the staff is anxious. Uh, as long as we follow the rules, uh, we'll be able to operate. Um, having smaller sections to some faculty is a boon because they can do more attention uh, in exchange for the, for the added uh, steps that need to be taken. Uh, on the other hand, certain other classes like lecture classes where we may have 50 students or 60 students enrolled, 20% uh, of those students will be permitted in the classroom the remainder have to take it online. So that could be a challenge that could be an issue and or we create two sections an online section in there, uh, and a, uh, a couple of uh, in-person sections we're waiting to hear back actually from the faculty to find out how many uh, have signed up to teach remotely and then we'll work backwards in terms of from that uh, yeah so uh rudy you have that fabulous new building uh that's all open yes so how are, what are you doing about that? We basically, we are reconfiguring every space, including that big new room and the new building to uh, follow the distancing guidelines. And we are doing some of the things that Tony mentioned in terms of uh, reconfiguring, rethinking classes uh, with, to include the, more sections or shifts. For instance, if a class meets uh, twice a week, uh, let's say Monday, Wednesday, Monday you'll have a group A from that class and the group B following online and Wednesday is group B in the classroom uh, and vice versa. But fortu fortunately, actually, we don't have many of these classes with a large number of students because the, the classes at UM, at the School of Architecture, tend to be very small. This is part of our kind of boutique scale brand uh, uh, kind of uh, identity. But we do have some big classes and we are adjusting their modality to include uh, an online component or to create different uh, uh, multiple sections. So, uh, with the, the, the studio, the big room, I think, uh, considering what we now know about how the virus is communicated, I think those spaces, the big spaces with very modern ventilation systems that can be equipped with uh, UV light, and this is what we are in the process of doing now, actually, uh, uh, installing UV uh, sun, uh, uh, light in the ducts etc those actually we are confident that they are safe the challenge is greater challenge i think is in the older buildings with window units etc where actually we, you don't get a, a very good air circulation yes yeah, yeah, so the, we are we are working on those now these are more uh, difficult to uh, work with i'm sure jason you're doing the same things but uh, do you have any additional insight um yeah this, we're doing the same things and the idea that i mean safety is paramount in our minds for our faculty and staff um and it's it's again it's a two-way street obviously people are saying you know young young kids don't get sick okay 
great. But then we also have older faculty that teach those young kids and then we have staff. So there's multiple populations that need to be considered here. Um, uh, so the option is sort of simultaneous. If we do have a small face-to-face -face, that there would be a remote moment so that you could, you weren't forced to do that is, is part of this plan. Um, and then thinking of using the building in new ways. We have our freshmen, the very first project they do is they go and they measure our courtyard and do a, a, a kind of constructed hand drawing of it. Um, sounds like a perfect thing with social distancing to do, site visits. I think there's a lot of ways to get outside of the building, we're thinking. Um, and then if we're inside the sort of, the very Spartan uh, plan of a studio with few uh, occupied desks, as I'm sure everyone has a version of it by now, but um, so a mix of those things is what we're looking at. So I have, I'm gonna go now to, we have a couple of um, interesting questions. And um, one I think is very timely. Um, and it's uh, for decades, black architects consist of less than 2% of the profession. Black architecture students are also a rarity in most, I'm guessing that's non-historically black. He did the acronym uh, colleges and universities. Is that an issue for colleges and how are architecture schools uh, addressing the issue of recruiting and retaining black architecture students? Uh, Tony. Um, thanks, Cheryl. It's a great question. Uh, I, I would have to say on behalf of FAU that we pride ourselves on our diversity. Uh, we have a, a, a number of black students, uh, both male and female. Um, well, I will admit, however, that our faculty does not reflect the diversity of our student body. And um, we're all aware of that and working on ways to improve that statistic for that demographic. Um, with regard to um, uh, this whole issue, uh, I believe the entire profession has a duty uh, to examine itself, its history, uh, the way we teach, what we include in what we teach, how we design space. For example, um, I think everybody here, Jason and Rudy, have received these repeated emails uh, calling for uh, reform and uh, challenging architecture schools um, to um, address racial inequity in, uh, in design. And um, among those is the training or the teaching of SEPTE, crime prevention for environmental design and defensible space techniques. But these are the types of things that the faculty are in very active discussion. We hold weekly forums with faculty and students, even in the summer, uh, where students uh, raise questions, have a voice, um, I believe that this is a process that begins with self-education, uh, particularly among the faculty, I would include myself in that group, uh, who feel themselves progressive, uh, colorblind, uh, probably feel I get it because I'm liberal, but the reality is I'm contributing to the problem. So we are uh, both at the university level and in the community level, uh, reading, learning, opening uh, forums to hear those voices and uh, uh, listen uh, for cues as to what we need to do and how we need to um, adapt and, and, and actually instigate change. Great. Uh, Rudy? Yeah, I, I really think that this has to start earlier. So uh, at, in high school or even earlier. So if the university can do something, it's actually in helping you. And I know, Cheryl, that you have programs that go to high schools and introduce architecture. Yes, our black architects in, in the making. Thanks, Craig Akar. I know you're on the call. <laughs> and I want to go here on record, actually extending uh, our resources and well, uh, uh, our help to work with you on these programs because I think this is where we can make the biggest difference in starting earlier. And I think the university can help with that. That's uh, great. So we can, after this, maybe we can have a call and uh, discuss. Oh yeah, boy, we're gonna, we'll, we'll, we're gonna follow <laughs> up on that, that's for sure. Uh, Jason? Um, yeah, no, I, I appreciate Craig's comments. Um, and we were going to have uh, BAM at FIU right before COVID started. So I 
I feel ter terrible that that didn't happen, but it, it will happen. Um, and I agree with my colleagues' comments. Um, I, I think part of, uh, again, our faculty, we, we just issued a, a letter, uh, actually we sent it out yesterday, uh, looking at these issues. And I agree with uh, both our, my colleagues. We, we do have a huge amount of culpability here. Um, it is about, you know, not just us, but the country we're in. And whether you're uh, active or inactive, it makes no difference. It's a reality we all have to deal with. Um, but I think a lot of beyond the rhetoric is really looking at strategic goals that will address these problems and having a series of action items that you can measure because you can say, you know, platitudes are great, except if they do nothing, then what was the point of them? So we're, we're looking to, again, start this process, really have measurable outcomes and move the needle on that because it is, it is something that is about as important a thing that the, the, the country, I would say, has to address at this moment. I could add okay. something, sorry. Sure, sure. Because it, it, it relates a bit to this whole experience with COVID. And I don't know if my colleagues noticed this or any of your faculty reported it, but when you try to uh, certify your class as a quality online class, which is a whole other topic, this issue of online education has to be high quality. Otherwise, students and parents think they're not getting their value. Sure. But to get a certified class, you have to have a complete copyright clearance on all the material. Architects are notorious for just taking a, and, and this is the reason for this is because the books are so expensive, they're limited editions, journals, books, uh, monographs, that you either scan them or you take pictures of them and you project these images. Uh, the fact that you can't do that for online and be certified is a problem. Uh, and the bigger problem is students who can't afford access to these materials have a bigger problem because they are not, that material is not made available to them or accessible to them simply because of its affordability. So again, it underscores kind of this elite nature that you have to be able to afford these expensive publications uh, to, to gain insight or to learn. I found in through Creative Commons and searches on these open platforms that are available to other disciplines, and I need to recognize that other disciplines share this along with architecture. A lot of that information is absolute junk, valueless, useless. The valuable information is very difficult to find and very difficult to get online and provide freely to students. And that's something for the profession to think about, how we share information, how we are mentoring the future generations, how we're opening up uh, the secrets, if you will, the tools, the tricks of the trade that they need to learn uh, in a way that is accessible. Yeah, that's an, an interesting comment. You know, one of the other comments uh, is not only recruiting and retaining Black students, but also Black professors and staff that, the, you know, the, there needs to be a commitment uh, there from all of the institutions to do that. Um, one other question, I think it was answered before, will some classes be offered online and some in person? Yes, I think everybody uh, had answered that, uh, that they're uh, working um, towards that. And then will there be a rule that a certain amount of students can go through a door at once to avoid the groups going out and in, in and out of the classrooms? I'm not sure that I understand that because a door only can fit a certain number of people going in and out. But I think all of these classes are, all of these rules are gonna be set up for physical distancing. Right, actually including, for instance, we are changing the way we use the, hot, the corridors so that now they will be all only one way. Exactly, but I think this question is pointing in that direction. So right. We have to start to use some of these spaces in a different way while the pandemic is with us, yes. I, I mean, I know that, that at FIU and at UM there is a lot of room for maybe bringing classes outside. I, I don't know if you have that same situation in, in, uh, in Broward. Uh, it's a little more urban, but are you considering doing that, Jason? 
Uh, I'm in Miami, but. Uh, oh, I know, uh, I know. Uh, yeah, I think we, we, we are thinking of that. I mean, one of, the, one of our um, uh, sort of core values was our building as social space. Um, we actually have it listed and the ones we did, we added a couple years ago. So we've actually, we've, it's like all architecture, it's a kind of love hate relationship with the building. I am on the love side. I've, I've, I'm quite <laughs> lucky with it. And, and I have to convince some of my colleagues that that's worth loving the big hunk of concrete, but it's, it's courtyard, it's open walkways. Um, it's, it's rooftop terrace. These kinds of things are, are, are great. Um, and we have, you know, once the sun sets, it, they, they become populated very quickly. Um, and I, I always joke somewhere in sort of February, January, where we're having an outside crit, I remind all our students of our colleagues up north who are, who are incredibly <laughs> envious of our t-shirts and shorts pinning up on our glass and having a view outdoors. So we, we have a, again, we have a, a climate that allows for that. Um, we've always embraced it. So I think it, uh, Again, I, 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 the, the last point just to, to loop back is both this issue of, of COVID and Black Lives Matter, I think education sits sort of squarely as important parts to address both of them. And if education is somehow this idea of advancing reason and empathy, both of those things are, are needed for both contexts. I mean, I, all too often there's this kind of horrible rhetorics on both, both topics about you know it doesn't involve me and that this sort of profound problem of a lack of empathy is is at the core of this and I, and i wonder and i will just wonder out loud that these kinds of uh disembodied engagements have a tendency certainly when you watch these kind of noisy tv shows of of eroding at both reason and empathy and i fear i'll also say it that we have to be careful about embracing some of these things, these newfangled toys, because I think they don't help as, as tools, not to give, I mean, again, good tools can be used anyway, but I see that that could be a problem down the road for both issues. And I, again, the last conversation I had is uh, with someone, I guess this was last weekend walking, that they were very frustrated because none of their friends were sick. So what the hell difference did it make to them? And I'm like, well, you know, that's not the point. So oh. it's, it's, it's ever present, this sort of problem of empathy. That, uh, right, and, right. And when you're young, it's, um, you know, you're indestructible in your mind. So we only have a couple of minutes left, and I wanted to give each of you an opportunity um, to uh, quickly kind of leave us with um, something you'd like us to remember uh as as we leave and i, I want to thank all of you thank everyone for uh, your participation and thank all three of you um, and daphne for participating and if you um kind of close out and uh let us know what you'd like us to remember tony oh uh all of it <laughs> Actually, I think part of, if I would say how AIA might help or what they can remember <clears throat> might be uh, how we pay attention to those most vulnerable in our community, um, whether it's folks that have high risk to COVID or to students that are vulnerable because of their uh, social economic uh, backgrounds, um, and that the AIA work with us, work with AIAS, uh, in areas of training and, and mentoring uh, and maybe step up the game a little bit. Um, so I really believe that we can work together uh, and the lessons we're learning from this, uh, we should be able to share with each other as we uh, move, move past these issues. Absolutely. Well, collaboration is my middle name. Um, Jason, parting thoughts. Um, I, I, I just think we can't forget that this is a, a social uh, human operation at hand, uh, even though architecture has a tendency to be about in, in, inanimate objects. Um, and any sort of social proposition is, is fraught with responsibility. Um, and I think to sort of hide behind uh, disciplinary norms uh, to ignore 
the effects is, is problematic. And I assume any sort of critical educated individual would understand that. But I would argue that that is in rare short supply most of the time. Um, and, uh, you know, me and my colleagues are, are working to combat that every day. So uh, uh, I still feel hopeful about that, even with the sort of problems at hand. But uh, I do always have to give pause that I wonder how effective we are again. But I'm hopeful. <laughs> Rudy, parting thoughts. So uh, uh, mo these periods of crisis tend to show, to reveal the cracks basically in the system. So this is why I want to reiterate what Tony said about the being attuned to the fragile aspects of our society, the most vulnerable. But also the, the crises tend to also accelerate and uh, exacerbate some trends. Uh, so uh, so uh, there is, I'm optimistic about how actually we will see inno innovation and new tools emerging from the crisis that will help us in different ways and take maybe the learning experience in a new direction. So th for me, there is that silver lining also uh, uh, that right. I retain from the crisis. Thanks, Daphne. You want to uh, say goodbye? Oh, yeah. No, I just want to thank everybody for participating in today's um, um, town hall meeting. And it was very impactful for me to hear uh, my colleagues speak about their universities and, and their thoughts. And I really appreciate the idea that crises can accelerate positive change. So I'd like to leave it on that note, because uh, I do believe that we can make something good coming of both COVID-19 and recent events with and like support Black Lives, Black Lives Matter and support our, our fellow human mankind. Thanks, Daphne. And all three of you guys, we are here and ready to collaborate in any way. So always feel free to reach out. Thank you all again. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing uh, everybody log in when we have our discussion with, with students and with professors. So thank you, everybody. Take care. Thank bye -bye. you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye.